So in review, I'm just going to mention that John F. Kennedy was born in Brookline, Massachusetts on May 29, 1917. He was often ill as a child. He was born one leg shorter than the other, which led to back problems throughout his life. He was stricken with scarlet fever at the age of three. He attended elementary schools in both Massachusetts and New York. And at the age of 14, was sent to Shode Academy, a private high school in Connecticut. He was once expelled for mischievous behavior, but was reinstated shortly afterwards. He graduated from Shode Academy at the age of 18, was voted most likely to succeed by his classmates. And after graduation from prep school, Kennedy spent the summer of 1935 in England, where his father served as U.S. Ambassador to England under President Franklin Roosevelt. He returned from England, entered Princeton University, but was forced to leave the university at Christmas because he had developed jaundice, which was a yellow discoloration of tissues and body fluids caused by malfunction of the liver. After taking a semester off school to recovery, he entered Harvard University in the fall of 1936. He graduated from Harvard in June of 1940 with a major in government and international relations. And after graduation from Harvard, he revised the thesis he wrote, later published it into a book entitled Why England Slept, which was a book about England's failure to prepare for World War II. He then enrolled at Stanford University in the graduate program, but dropped out six months later. Why would he drop out of school six months later? What was happening in history that he was going to have to serve? World War II. So he knew that was coming about. He knew he was going to end up enlisting in the United States Navy. So what he did after he enrolled at Stanford University and dropped out six months later is he decided to travel first, and he took a trip through South America, and then he enlisted in the United States Navy. So he took a trip to South America on vacation and then enlisted in the United States Navy. He was very successful in the Navy. As just a 22-year-old, he was given command of a PT boat, which is like this, which was a patrol boat in the Pacific Theater of World War II. Anybody know what a PT boat was? Ever play Battleship? Ever play that game? It's the smallest ship on the board. Okay? It's a patrol boat. Basically, it goes around and communicates with allies where enemy ships may be, etc. So it's not a battleship. It's not very well defended. Now, they all had numbers, and Kennedy's boat was PT-109. PT-109 was Kennedy's patrol boat. And these boats are about 80 feet long. They're made mostly of wood. And like I mentioned, they have very little armor attached and are not easily, not, not even meant to defend anything. They're made, meant to, to scoot around and give communication. Well, during the time that Kennedy served as a commander of a PT boat, uh, PT-109, he was patrolling in the Blackett Strait in the Solomon Islands. And we talked about the Battle of the Solomons and that type of thing in World War II. And he was patrolling what was known as the Blackett Strait, which is your, on your ID sheet, in the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. In other words, he was patrolling that strait, which is a waterway by the Solomons, looking for enemy patrols so he could report information back to the Allies. Well, shortly after midnight, and this would have been like very early in the morning on August 2nd, 1943. Shortly after midnight, so it would have been very early in the morning, on August 2nd, 1943, keep in mind it was dark, PT-109 was hit and basically cut in two by a Japanese destroyer who was sailing in the same area who did not see that PT-109 boat in the water because they're very tiny. So shortly after midnight on August 2nd, 1943, PT-109 was hit and basically cut in two by a Japanese destroyer. That would be a large battleship that was sailing in the area. Now, two of Kennedy's men were killed during the initial collision. Andrew Kirksey and Harold Marney were two of Kennedy's men that were killed in the initial collision with this Japanese destroyer. Andrew Kirksey and Harold Marney. 
were killed during the initial collision. And basically what Kennedy did and his other ten men is they hung on the wreckage all night trying to figure out what they were going to do. So Lieutenant Kennedy and the other men hung on to the wreckage all night. What do you think they did as light approached? Because they were in enemy waters, obviously. What did they do? They sat there and hang on to that wreckage so they could be captured? No, what did they do? What would you do? What? Swim. And they, Kennedy ordered his men to swim to a nearby island known as Plum Pudding Island. So after they hung on the wreckage all night, just as dawn became available to them, Kennedy ordered his men to swim to a nearby island, Plum Pudding Island. It was about three and a half miles away, and it was behind enemy lines, and it took him about three hours to swim there. Okay? So Kennedy orders his men to swim to a nearby island, Plum Pudding Island. The island's about three and a half miles away. It's behind enemy lines, and it took him about three hours to swim it. Now, Lieutenant Kennedy actually damaged his back in the initial crash and was injured. Okay, he damaged his back in the original crash and was injured. And even though he was injured, he told one of his injured men who could not swim, basically tied a belt around him and towed him in his teeth. Okay, even though he was injured and damaged his back in the initial crash, he told one of his injured men who could not swim to Plum Pudding Island. That sailor's name was Patrick Happy McMahon. Excuse me. Patrick Happy McMahon was the badly injured soldier. He was badly burned. Because obviously the ship had fuel on it, right? This BT boat. And fires started, and he was badly burned during the collision. So Basically, Kennedy took McMahon's life jacket straps, belts into his teeth and swam him to safety, despite the fact that he had injured his back in the initial crash. Well, if you can picture Plum Pudding Island, it was 100 yards in diameter. What's diameter? This or this? Okay, so 100 yards. So if you went out to the football field, that's all, the, all it was the width of that island, very small. It's 100 yards in diameter. No food on the island, no water on the island. So what do you think they lived off during that time? What did they eat on that island to survive? No? Salty water, didn't have any fishing equipment. On the island, what would you eat? What? Oh, I'm pretty close. Insects. They had to eat bugs. They might eat some plants, I don't know. But they, according to history, they lived off bugs. And a, free, and a few drops of fresh water they could find. And where would they find those? Probably on the leaves of the palm trees, okay? Well, Kennedy knows that they're not going to hold out very long on this little tiny island, so he enlists the help of his lead officer, George Barney Ross. He enlists the help of his lead officer, George Barney Ross. Now, what do you think they're going to do? Anybody have an idea if you were in that position? What would you do? You don't want to stay there. You want to try to get what? Try to get, you want to try to get some help. You want to get off that island. How would you do that? What would you have to do to try to get help, do you think? <coughs> what? You'd have to swim. So the two men, uh, Kennedy and Ross, took turns swimming out into a place called Ferguson Passage, which was a shipping channel in the Pacific, and all they had was a flashlight for a signal. So they took turns swimming out into Ferguson Passage, which was a shipping channel in the Pacific Ocean, with just a flashlight for a signal. And for four straight nights, those guys took turns swimming out into that channel in shark-infested waters with just a flashlight, hoping to hail down a friendly patrol like theirs to try to get some help. So the two men took turns swimming out into Ferguson Passage, which was a shipping channel in the Pacific Ocean with just a flashlight for a signal. And with just that flashlight in shark-infested waters, Kennedy and Ross repeated their swim 
for four straight nights, hoping to hail a passing Allied patrol to take their men to safety. Unfortunately, their efforts were to no avail. Well, what would you do now if you didn't have anything to eat on that island? What, what might you do next? What? Well, no, that, that's a good good idea, but they had no raft, but what would you build a raft to do? Well, why would you build one? To maybe get to another island that might be more prosperous? Pretty close, they had no raft, so what did Kennedy order his men to do? Swim to another nearby island, Os Ol Asana Island. Ol Asana, Ol Asana Island. Now, at least this island had coconut trees and water. But still, things look pretty bleak for a rescue. You can only last so long in an island with coconuts and water. So Kennedy orders his men to swim to another nearby island, Olasana Island. And even though this island had coconut trees and water, things still look pretty bleak. Now, unbeknownst to Kennedy as men, that explosion that early in the morning of August 2nd, 1943, was cited by that fellow at the top there, Lieutenant Arthur Evans. And he cited that explosion from a high spot. He was an Australian coast watcher. And he basically watched the coast for things like this to happen. And, and unbeknownst to them, the explosion of PT-109 was spotted by Lieutenant Arthur Evans, an Australian coast watcher. Now he was stationed on top of Rendovo Island on a volcano. He actually was stationed on top of a dormant volcano on Rendovo Island which was an American military base in the Solomons, and he scouted enemy waters from that secret observation post at the top of the volcano, and he saw this explosion early in the morning on August 2nd. And again, he was stationed on a dormant volcano on Mandovo Island, which is an American military base. Now this is quite a story. So he hears the blast, and he calls for two Solomon Islanders who were giving their services to the Allies in World War II. Basic natives, native islanders of the Solomon Islands who decided that they were going to help the Allies in World War II. Their names, and I'm not guaranteeing a pronunciation here, and I won't make you responsible even to spell these, Bayuku Gaza and Eroni Kamana were two native Solomon Islanders that Lieutenant Arthur Evans sent out to look for possible survivors from this explosion that he had witnessed. How'd they go out? They rode what? Canoes. Little canoes. So after he heard the blast, Evans calls for two Solomon Islanders to take their dugout canoes and go look for any possible survivors from the explosion he had witnessed. And I'll be darned if they don't find Lieutenant Kennedy and his men on that island. They find them. And when they walk up upon Kennedy's men, they are asleep and these Two natives are holding Japanese weapons. So what do you think the first thought is from Kennedy and his men? They are going to be captured because they recognize these Japanese weapons that these two natives have and they wake up to seeing those two at gunpoint, basically. Well, this really could have caused an intense confrontation, but Kennedy intervened. He cooled the situation down and got friendly with these natives that Arthur Evans had sent to look for them. So he pulled out his pad and paper and his pen and he wrote a nice note down for these natives to give to Arthur Evans so they could be rescued. I mean he pulled that, he had a three ring binder and pulled out his loose leaf paper and the three or four pens he had in his, no, they didn't have anything. So what did he do? And I gave you these handouts. 
He took a coconut and carved a message on a coconut. And it basically said, Commander, native knows position, he can pilot, 11 alive, needs small boat, Kennedy. You don't have to write that down. But that's what he carved on this po coconut. Commander, native knows position, he can pilot, 11 alive, needs small boat, Kennedy. If you look at the handouts when you get time, you'll see pictures of that. Pretty amazing when you think about it. And he carved that SOS message on that coconut, and he gave it to the natives, and they rode 38 miles back through Japanese-held waters and delivered that coconut to Lieutenant Arthur Evans. So the natives took the coconut, rode 38 miles through Japanese-held waters, and delivered that message back to Lieutenant Evans. Pretty incredible when you think about it. Well, once Evans got that coconut, he ordered those natives to return to the island and bring only Lieutenant Kennedy back to meet with Evans so they could find a strategy to get the men off there. Because they're in enemy waters. You think they're just going to row out there and they're going to take their boat out there and bring these guys back? No. And he kind of wants to find out what the story is too. So once the message was delivered to Evans, the natives were ordered to return to the island and bring Lieutenant Kennedy back to Rendoval Island to meet with Lieutenant Evans. So the natives row back to the island. They put Kennedy in their canoe and they cover him with palm tree leaves and make him stay low because they're going to be rowing back through enemy waters. So they actually hide him in this canoe at the bottom of the canoe and cover him with palm leaves. Well, Kennedy gets back. He and Evans meet. Arrangements are made for the rescue of Kennedy's crew. And on Sunday, August 8th of 1943, American PT boats picked up and rescued the remaining survivors from PT-109. So Kennedy goes back, meets with Evans, they make arrangements, and on August 8th of 1943, American PT boats pick up and rescue the remaining survivors from PT-109. Now, Lieutenant Kennedy retrieved that coconut that he had carved the important message on, and he kept it for the rest of his life. He had it encased in a plastic case, which I have you have a picture of, and he served, he, it's, it was kept on his desk while he served in the House, Senate, and the Presidency. And I don't remember if I told you this or not, but many years ago, I finally got an appointment with Senator Ted Kennedy, and then that doggone Richard Nixon died on us, and Ted Kennedy went to his funeral and canceled the appointment, but they let my kids and I go into Ted Kennedy's office, and that coconut was on his desk. Boy, that was cool. I think it's now, don't quote me, but I think it's in the JFK library in, in Boston now. I think that's where it's at. But anyway, he kept it the rest of his life. Well, the harm to Kennedy's back during this ordeal resulted in his honorary discharge from the Navy in March of 1945. So he was honorably discharged from the Navy in March of 1945 due to the back problems that he encountered because of PT-109. And he was awarded the Marine Navy Medal for Bravery for his actions concerning PT-109. And he was given his medal by Captain Frederick L. Conklin. Here he is right up here. Captain Frederick L. Conklin. Gave John F. Kennedy his medal for bravery. And when he was given his medal for bravery from Captain Frederick L. Conklin of the United States Navy, he was quoted as saying, the real heroes are not the men who return, but those who stay out there, like plenty of them, two of my men included. So he passed a word on about the two men that he lost in the initial crash and said, you know, the real heroes aren't the ones that return, the real heroes are the ones that do not return. Well, during Kennedy's presidency, he wrote a book that was entitled PT-109, and it was written by Robert Donovan. PT-109, Robert Donovan. Now, if you look up here at this picture, you're going to see the cover of a movie that was made also called PT-109. 
and an actor by the name of Cliff Robertson played John F. Kennedy in the movie. So this turned out to be quite the story. Not only was a book written about it, but also a movie was put together as well. And Robert Donovan wrote the book PT-109, and Cliff Robertson starred as John F. Kennedy in the movie, which was kind of a big deal. That book is very, very valuable and hard to find in the original PT-109 book. Now, the movie was actually previewed by President Kennedy for factual accuracy before its release. Okay? Now, we're going to continue our lecture in a minute, but I'm going to throw on a short video here about this PT-109 experience so you can kind of see it for yourself before we move on. Patty, my dear, if you could get the lights on the door while you're up, that'd be awesome. Thank you, dear. Okay, here we go. An unexpected item tells the story of one future president who exhibits all these traits in the face of impossible odds. We find it in Boston, Massachusetts, a shard of coconut fiber engraved with an important message is an everyday object that becomes a lifesaver and an image maker. 